Hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, this feels really strange, uh, and I'm kind of delighted to be on this kind of first of a unique event that's hybrid. And uh, it feels a little bit like Eurovision Song Contest, actually. <laughs> and uh, for those people who are not from Europe, you may that, that reference may actually be lost on you, but uh, it's a really important cultural event we had here, I think, last week. So I'll try and be entertaining as uh, some of the entries. So I am Ricardo. I am an advocate for open source AWS. And in this session, in this talk, I'm going to hopefully uh, show you how you can orchestrate hybrid workflows. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about why. So um, I have had lots of conversations with customers and uh, some common patterns have come up in those conversations. Many of them are moving to cloud, but they're not there yet. So they have to maintain kind of like existing applications uh, and workloads wherever they might be, right? So quite often that's in their data centers, but it's also in, you know, remote offices, um, maybe factories. And so the question is, how can you, you know, incorporate those without moving those? Because it's sometimes not easy or even not appropriate. Um, the other thing, especially in Europe, is there are some rules about what we can do with data, okay? So sometimes we can't process the data in the cloud, right, for various rules, and that, that rule changes uh, across the world. So, you know, based on specific regimes, you know, you have this situation where you want to leverage um, and do stuff with data, and you want to orchestrate it with Apache Airflow, but how can you do that um, without falling foul of the rules? Um, and, you know, together with that, you want to do that in a way that is kind of, you know, easy to do, right? You don't, we don't want these really complex um, uh, things to manage. And obviously, we're cost sensitive at the moment. So how can we do that in a way that um, we can manage and at least understand the costs? So these are kind of, com these, these are kind of common things that, uh, that I'm hearing. And today, if we wanted to, you know, kind of implement uh, a hybrid um, workflow, then we've got a number of different um, way operators we can do that. In fact, actually, most Airflow operators can work this way if you have a network connectivity. So some kind of VPN solution to that, right? So if, for example, we have uh, uh, data in a MySQL database, these are just some of the options, okay, that we can use to get the data or orchestrate a workflow to get the data um, uh, off that MySQL data. So we could start off perhaps maybe with the, you know, the SQL to S3 operator. But, you know, one of the challenges there is that we need to have that network connectivity. What if we don't want to have that? Maybe we've got lots of different sites uh, and that will be an expensive and complex thing to manage. Um, but also, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem if we're working in a regulated environment because we're still doing that processing if we're running uh, Apache Airflow in the cloud. So how do we, you know, uh, overcome that? And that's actually a common uh, sort of pattern across all these different operators. And so effectively, you know, to kind of like put a picture on this, you're running in the cloud um, somewhere. You've got your workload that's not in the cloud and you've got that bit in the middle. How do you bridge that gap without having to set up a complex uh, VPN? And I'm not, I've got nothing against VPNs, by the way. I have one at home and they're great. Um, but for the, for, for the purposes of, you know, um, many organizations that don't have, say, dedicated network engineers or want a simpler solution, what other options um, do you have? Now, together with that, and I'm really happy that uh, the presentation happened before, one of the things that I'm seeing with customers that are using Apache Airflow is them moving to a model of leveraging the containerized uh, operators to package up their ETL logic using existing uh, kind of container or development workflows they've got pushing that to uh, a container repository, and then orchestrating that via Apache Airflow. It's, it's an increasingly uh, common uh, pattern. Uh, and uh, for many of the reasons the previous presentation gave, and the one actually that seems to happen a lot, actually, is that it allows you to extend uh, beyond Python, right? Most um, uh, you know, data engineering teams, they have SQL experience, Java experience, they're running Apache Spark. 
they they want to be able to use those skills. Maybe they've got existing scripts. How can they leverage those um, in the, in this scenario? Okay, so um, there's you know, two operators here. You can use the Kubernetes operator, which allows you to then, if you've got Kubernetes experience, to configure um, that to deploy on Kubernetes, which is all good. Um, but you need to manage a Kubernetes infrastructure on these remote sites, and that's not trivial. Okay. Um, and then we've got ECS operator. ECS is actually a um, AWS container orchestration system um, and allows you to easily run containers in the cloud. Um, but one of the interesting things is that um, we last year we launched a, a thing called ECS Anywhere that allows you to install a piece of software and then effectively run a, that, a container very easily without having to set up a VPN. So what happens is it creates a... Actually, I think I've got, a, I've got a nice diagram of it here. It actually installs a bunch of um, software. Um, some of it is open source. Um, and it creates a connection to the ECS control plane. Um, and it's an outbound connection but rather than an inbound connection. And then it uses that to connect to the control plane so it can receive and send uh, data. Um, and it's a very easy install. And I've actually got a demo. So this, this talk is hopefully less slides and uh, more demo. Uh, and uh, luckily for me, um, I was persuaded not to do it live. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because that's going to work, isn't it, when we're, we're trying to do that. So I have actually recorded it. So I'm going to uh, uh, dance as I, uh, as, as it, as it, no, I'm going to talk through the demo um, to show this actually working. OK, um, and, you know, whether you're running on Linux or even Windows, you can actually do this. So if you're a Windows shop, you can do this. Or if you're a Linux shop, um, you've been able to do that. OK, so so the idea is that effectively now, if I've got a remote office and I don't have much technical expertise there, but I've got data. OK, I can um, effectively run my ETL logic in that location. The processing is done in that location. And then I can send back whatever I'm allowed to send back to um, my data warehouse, wherever that might be. Okay. And even though I'm using the, the orchestrator here as workflow in the cloud, you could also, if you wanted to schedule that um, uh, with um, kind of airflow running anywhere, the only kind of guess the cloud glue is really the ECS control plane. So now let's do the demo. Okay, so this is this is where it's gonna get interesting. I've got to try and figure out how to do this. So for people watching, I'm hoping this is going to work. I'm going to make this. So, right. Okay. So, um, and also, the, I'm going to pause so that I can catch up and, and all this kind of stuff. So um, the demo that I'm going to show, uh, all the code is reproducible by anyone who wants to. Uh, and I've also written a blog post that actually walks you through the whole steps of recreating it if you um, uh, were brave enough to want to try this. So I'll share the, the actual link is actually um, uh, shared in the actual um, uh, next slides. So when you check out the repository, um, you have a structure. And the first thing I, I do in this demo is show you the actual data. What, I, what I've done is I've actually used one of these online fake data generators to create some sample PII data. So emails, actually what's going on? Is this not working? There we go, that, that would help. Um, so it's got effectively, here we go, it's catching up. And I've got two databases. I've got one running on MySQL RDS in the cloud. And then I've got another one on an EC2 instance that's, that's simulating um, a uh, effective data center. And I've also got it running on my local Mac in a virtual box as well, right? So that's kind of like, a, let's say, a, a really remote place. So you can see the data there. It looks pretty innocuous. But if I was running you know, in a regulated environment, that might cause problems. Um, I, OK, so that's that bit. And, and I just basically show this is running on my local, my, my uh, virtual box. We can see that the data looks exactly the same. Um, there we go. Uh, and um, I have also got um, in this data, there's a column that basically says consent. So it's a one and zero. So you could potentially use that to know which data you could process, that kind of thing. So here we go. There you go, weapon sent equals one. Oh, this is a really weird experience this is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God, my typing's good. 
So you can you get the idea, right? It's yeah. it's it's just some sample data that we've got to be careful with, right? So we're simulating a, a, a regulated environment, and we've got um, a script which come on, Q script um, that we've written, and it's a really sophisticated script. Um, of course, and this one happens to be Python because I'm not really a particularly strong coder, but Python I can just about get with, get, get by with. And what this script does, um, it, it actually just does a, um, a simple query against that data and then upload that into a, a, a fake data lake, let's say on S3. So hopefully when, when you see this, let's have a look, come on. So at this point, I realize what exactly I was recording. So, okay. So this is the script. <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty simple, um, but it takes five parameters, okay? The S3 bucket, we want to store the data to, the file name, and then the query we want to execute. Um, and then we actually have, and um, we use a, a kind of parameter store to actually control the configuration information of the data we want with the target we want to. Um, so here we got three um, and it's about to show you a password. Don't worry, these have been deleted, so it's no use to you at all. But you can see that it's a effectively it's a key <laughs> it's a key value <laughs> I guess. it's a key value store that basically this is how the script knows which data base to uh, connect to. Yeah. Um, so you get the idea, right? Pretty simple. Okay, and now I'm going to show you how it runs just to show you it works. This feels really it feels wrong. But, you know, because I know it's going to work. <laughs> uh, where's the fun in that? <laughs> so you can see this is the output. And I'm going to highlight um, what, I, what, what I wrote in the script. There's just some information so you can see what database I'm connecting to, the IP address, and the source. And obviously, you're probably going to get, get it. As we do this demo and show it moving around, that will change to show where it's running. So all good. So, you know, typically you might have that. And the first step, you know, uh, we, when, we're, when we're doing this is to containerize this, okay? Um, so let's move this forward a bit. Uh, let's have a look, what's it doing now? I have no idea what I'm doing now. <laughs> Am I doing it again? Oh, no, I think what I'm doing is, I'm actually, I'm showing you how to run against the other database. Okay, cool. So I'm running the same script, and I'm gonna run against the fake um, data center one, just to show you that it produces um, a report and that the information in the script shows it's pointing to another database just so the script actually does what it says. All routine stuff, okay? So that's all good. So the next step you typically do, okay, is you want to containerize this. So um, uh, we put together a Docker file, which I'm ahead of this now, but you're going to see it. So it's all going to magically hopefully align. And our Docker file is going to containerize this. We're going to use a simple base Python image. Uh, it, this is nothing um, particularly fancy. Um, and then the entry point into that is that script that I just showed you running, okay? Um, so in order to package this up, there's a script rather than typing all those commands separately. There's a setup script, which you'll see here, that um, has some variables to define uh, the, the configuration information I want for this particular demo. I run it, and all it's going to do is actually run through, log into ECR, do the build, do the tag, do the push, and then in a few seconds... Um, thanks to the magic of the demo, it's going to put this in ECR, and we'll be able to run that same script through Docker Run. Okay, so we'll hopefully see that happening. Uh, there we go. See, I paused it there just to save everyone from the tedium of watching a, a Docker push. Um, but you get the idea, right? So what am I doing now? I'll see you up for a cup of tea there, I think. No, nope, okay. So there we go. Now um, I'm going to run the Docker command. Okay, come on. So what I'm doing here is I'm just showing you that actually it has put the container image there. Um, now, actually, as whilst we're waiting for this, who actually here it uses containers to store and run their their their, their and orchestrate their um, ETL logic? Is it a common pattern? Are people doing it? Hands up. A few. Okay. Cool. Good. Um, it's in, it is something that I'm I'm seeing only about probably 20% or 30% of people that I speak to do that. Um, but it's increasingly getting common, uh, popular. So let me pause it before that. Before I do that. So what I've done there is actually, can you see it? Can you see it? Is it clear? It's probably not very clear at the back. So apologies for that. Um, what what I've just done there is just done Docker run for that container image, and you can see that basically it's just returned an error. It's returned an error because uh, I haven't submitted the parameters for the script. The, the, it will fail if I don't enter the information, such as the S3 bucket the file, the query, et cetera. So I'm going to repeat that 
it's going to do that again, just so you get an idea of the typical and like flow of containerizing. Uh, oh, and we get an error, but I knew this was going to happen because I didn't su supply AWS credentials. And then luckily I've got a um, already pre-populated um, file. Now what I have done, which I, which I didn't show, obviously, is I exported my AWS access and secret. I didn't want you to see that because I don't know what you're going to do with that information. Um, so as you can see here now, um, we've run it and the, she is, let me pause it, let me pause it. You can see that the source IP now is the Docker. Um, uh, run. So we can see that it's actually running now from uh, Docker. So let's um, do that again. And this time I'm going to show you running, uh, okay, the proper query this time. So Poland. So I'm not sure why I chose Poland, by the way. That was completely random. Uh, I've got nothing against Polish people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was that was completely coincidental. So there you go. So all good. We've now got a situation where we're happy to run our ETL logic. Next stage is to run it on um, the cloud. So to do that, I have got, and I'm going to show very quickly, um, uh, a uh, CDK scripts. So CDK is infrastructure as code, which allows you to configure ECS. Um, I've already pre-configured it or pre-run it so that I don't have to um, go through the process. But again, if you're reproducing this yourself, um, it will actually just configure all the resources for you, the IAM roles, security policies, and it's it's scoped down to the bare minimum permissions rather than um, uh, maximizing the permissions, uh, which is common for, 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 for demos. Um, so let's move this a bit forward. So I'm just going, I'm just going to scroll through this here. It's not particularly interesting. So let's move forward a bit. So what we get from the end of this, once we've deployed this, is a cluster in ECS. Now, um, let me pause it here. The ECS, um, the CK app deploys a CD, a CD, uh, ECS cluster with an EC2 instance, uh, which is where containers will run. OK, um, and that is in the cloud. So if I resume that um, within ECS, you have a thing called task definition, task definition of the container applications you run. And you can see here when I expand this, the same parameters that I ran when I was running it as a script locally. Uh, um, oh, hang on, that's going too quick now. Let me slow that down. Right. OK, let's pause it there. No, no, don't do that. Right. OK. So you can see that that is the um, same script, okay, but now it's running uh, on ECS. Uh, and I'm then going to actually show it executing via ECS. So I think all we've done really is kind of follow a typical dev lifecycle of moving this, and we're running it still in the cloud, okay? There's no hybrid yet, um, but that will happen very shortly. Now, the first time you run it, it has to download the image container, it will run. You can see I've done it a few times before because um, uh, I was uh, trying to make sure it worked. Uh, and what will what, what this will show is actually show the log output. And again, when we look at the log output, you'll see that the source and the database information is now effectively the source IP is the um, EC2 instance that's running container images for for, for uh, ECS. Right. So this is all all very standard so far. Okay. So because ECS has got this EC2 instance, we introduced this new project called ECS Anywhere um, that allows us to install the software. And we do it by clicking on this button here, register external instance. And it walks us through and asks us to enter some information and it will create a script. We can run that script on any Linux or Windows machine. Um, and I'll, it'll, when it catches up, you'll see that. Um, I think it's the next, next screen. Um, and come on, next step. And there we go. There's the there's the Linux command. So we just copy that, and then I'm going to go to my virtual box. And I'm going to run that as root. Um, so you can see that was done today, this morning. Um, so this is fresh. And um, so I go log in as root, and this takes about five minutes to to run. Um, I I have run this test. I have run this demo live before, and this is the worst. Part of it because you never know if this is gonna it's gonna finish. But I've just paused it. You can see that it's successful. What this means is that now my ECS cluster has got an EC2 image in the cloud. But also now my laptop um, is now part of the um, uh, user plane, your data plane. So I can run my container on uh, ECS, or I can run it in that regional um, uh, location. 
So I'm going to run the same script, but this time I'm going to specify external, which is how you tag and how you show where to run that script. I'm going to um, do this. It's going to download the, the container for the first time. Um, and then we can see that it does exactly the same. It shows the same log information. The only difference being it's going to be the source IP um, of where it's running should be my virtual Mac, which you'll see. There you go. Mac virtual box is where it's running. So now what we've done is we've managed to get that, that container image, that ATL logic, to run on my local laptop. But so far, we're still accessing and connecting to the databases in the cloud, right? So the next step is to actually now introduce Airflow and start building some workflows using the ECS operator uh, and see how we can start putting these together to um, orchestrate that um, uh, whether we want to build a workflow that's in the cloud or on the um, remote places. So we use the standard ECS operator. This is a very simple DAG. We can see that we've got the ECS operator. We've got um, uh, a, a very simple default args. And then the actual um, ECS operator takes a number of different parameters. It takes the cluster, the ECS cluster name and the task definition, which I think I'll I slip um, to show that um, here. Um, and then we've got overrides, which we don't change uh, in, this, in this DAG. Um, and then we've got launch type. So launch type can be two, it can be EC2, so in the cloud or external, which would be anywhere you've installed the agent. So it could be on... Um, your Mac, it could be in your data center, it could be on another cloud provider, wherever you want to put it. Um, and when we enable this and run this, um, we should see exactly the same output, okay? So when we look at the logs, um, which, oh yeah, I think I forgot to, uh, this This is <laughs> this actually didn't work for some reason, I had to, I had to, re, I had to clear, the, uh, clear the state. So let's just do that. So you can't do when you're doing the demo for live. So, um, so it's running now. It doesn't take very long to run. And we can see when, when we look at the logs, it's got exactly the same information that we saw before, okay? Uh, um, it's just now it's in airflow as opposed to running it um, on the ECS, okay? Um, and so um, I repeat, so I create the next tag is to actually do the same thing but run on my Mac, on my, on my virtual box ring on my Mac. So this is the uh, Excel. So this is using the hybrid scenario so again it's exactly the same operator the only thing that's different is the launch type okay um and i repeat this and and then the third time we're gonna re we're gonna we're gonna do this out uh, just to the um the, the previous session um in, in order to try and maximize the reuse of your container images it's often useful to use overrides um so you have the same kind of script and etl logic but then provide different parameters so you can reuse, run different queries. Um, and, and so this is the kind of the third one and the second, which, which uh, we'll see. Um, so this is just showing the log that basically it's run on my Mac again. So again, this is all the same thing we did on the ECS control plane. We've now orchestrated through um, Airflow. And then the final one is where we actually now change the parameters using override. So here, for example, if you had one script, you had a team working on a script, you could keep using it, reusing that, and just provide different parameters. So, you know, you could have multiple DAGs with different scripts, et cetera. So it's, it makes it um, um, very reusable. And, and what I do here is, I think in this instance, uh, I'm using the same query uh, just to show it working. Oh, no, here, actually, I specify local. So local airflow um, is a lo that local MySQL instance, which I show here. The parameters and the secret values again uh that's only works on my machine so that password is no good to you um so now that's what should happen now when we trigger this we should see um the workflow running um the container on my mac on the databases on my mac and then storing the data on the s3 bucket i think i'm i'm not sure actually if i should show this on this demo the actual files but they are there i promise Bless you. Um, so here we can see the log, and you can see here the connecting to local MySQL on host IP, one local host on my Mac. So we can see there that it actually has actually um, worked, and we've actually managed to orchestrate that from Apache Airflow in the cloud, running locally, and then whatever that script, whatever we wanted it to do, it oh, actually, oh, 
I thought I was then I was getting excited and I thought it actually did. I did show what was happening. No, I don't. I just stopped there. So that was a very, a very quick demo, um, which I'm glad actually that I didn't, <laughs> didn't do live. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that. Okay, so let's have a look. Oh no, it's repeating. We don't want to do that again. Right, so let's have a look. Uh, how do I do that? Oh yeah, escape, I see. I remember now you said escape. Yes, escape. And once more. No. Oh, I think it's this thing, it's this there. Stop. Exit slideshow. And then, yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can. Yeah, no worries. Okay, right. So, a demo. I have, you know, it, I work in DevRel. It's part of the DevRel charter. You have to do demos because it's like folk singers. If, you, if, you, if you're a folk singer, you have to do a sing along. Um, and with DevRel, you have to do demos. So, I've done my demo. So, what, what effectively um, that demo did is it demonstrated that if you've got uh, target data, um, anywhere, and it doesn't have to be MySQL, it can be anything that your ETL logic um, um, needs to access. Um, irrespective of where it is, um, you can, in this instance, run the SQL extract, uh, and then you can schedule that through the magic that is uh, contain orchestration through Apache Airflow. Okay, um, so that's just the um, architecture of actually what gets built, um, which isn't particularly interesting. Um, what is interesting, however, is uh, and one, one of the reasons why I think this is a super powerful um, approach is it allows you to do a separation of duties. Um, so on the top layer, you have your data engineering who basically are writing the scripts uh, or writing the workflows, um, utilizing existing um, you know, uh, processes or workflows that they use and pushing down either the container image or the DAGs, the DAGs folder. And then everything underneath is then done by your sysops, admin, DevOps team to provision all that infrastructure. Um, and they don't need to um, get in each other's way. So it's a, it's a good way for scaling uh, um, and ensuring things like the data engineers don't need to know the passwords for the data systems they're using because that's provisioned automatically for them. The secret name or however you want it, you might be using Hashi Vault, that would then get um, provided to the data engineers to include in their ETL logic. Um, from a permissions perspective, um, there are a couple of key things to, 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 to bear in mind. Um, there are two kind of different types of permission used. There's one that's been used by the actual ECS control plane, so task definition, um, sorry, task execution role. And this is basically a minimal set of permissions that only allows you to connect to ECR to download the images, connect to CloudWatch to write the logs. And I think that's pretty much it. You don't want to give it anything else than that, right? Um, because it doesn't need it. And then you've got the task permissions, which are actually all the things that your application, your ETL logic needs to do. Um, and that's and that's how the, the kind of the two permissions run. And then if you're, in this instance, I was using um, the uh, AWS managed Apache Airflow service. We've got an additional role that tells it what it can do. So when we're putting those DAGs together, it can actually kick off an ECS task as well. So that's how the, the permissions I kick in. So the actual code for this uh, is available there. Um, I think these slides are being shared to everyone, so you can grab that. Um, and I have written a blog post so that it actually walks you through if, if, you, if you're interested in doing that. And that's that is actually that's my, my presentation. So I think I finished pretty pretty quickly. Um, hopefully enough time for questions. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Time for some questions. Yeah.